Merry Christmas and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. I'm Stan, Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies well, under DBED and uh, High Tech Development Corporation over there in Manoa. And we're here to talk about energy and uh, I'm really happy. I, I, actually, my guest for this week that I plan to do this week called me and said he, he couldn't do it till next week. And I'm even more fortunate to have a guy that I've been trying to get on my show for ages and ages and ages because um, to be quite frank with you, uh, he's one of the key reasons that, that I am such a fanatic about hydrogen. He's, uh, I met him about two and a half years ago uh, via Paul Pontio from Blue Planet Research. Uh, I read his book, um, The Hydrogen Civilization, Solar Hydrogen Civilization, um, and just started really thinking a lot about the benefits of hydrogen, what it can do for our, our economy as we try and grow uh, renewable energy and sustainable um, a sustainable economy, uh, really, an overall sustainable economy using hydrogen. So our guest today is, um, our show today is called Dr. Hydrogen, I presume. And uh, I say that because I know Roy McAllister is uh, definitely a PhD level uh, caliber guy who's uh, a um, chemical engineer by training and um, is just super knowledgeable about any and all things hydrogen. He's uh, He's done a couple books and translated a couple books and put a couple books on DVD and we'll, we'll show those to you a little bit later so if you want to order them yourself you can. But uh, he's, he's for me the be all and end all of uh, hydrogen info. So Roy, welcome to the show today. We really appreciate you being on from uh, over there in Arizona. And we had Claude Culberson here a couple weeks ago but uh, you know you're, you're his uh, hero too and we're glad to have you on today. So thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Sam. And could you tell us just a little bit about how you got into what you're doing and, and why, why hydrogen and what got you so fired up about hydrogen? Because you're, you're pretty darn passionate. Well, I grew up in rural Kansas. And my father's business was a machine shop for rebuilding engines. And we remanned engines of all descriptions, mostly for the oil field operations and for gas compressor station operations, but many of them went into communities and became a total energy system to produce the electricity and the heat that would be left over with the heat town hall or school or a hotel, produce something else that was useful instead of being thrown away at a central power plant. And eventually I came to work on the Santa Fe Railroad and became very interested in the rail engines and improving their efficiency. And ultimately was teaching at the University of Kansas in the 1960s. And I realized that I was teaching would-be engineers how to burn the fossil reserve faster. And even by that time, we were burning a million years of fossil oil, gas, and coal per year. A million years of nature's accumulation was burned every year. And since then, of course, we've greatly magnified our demand for the fossil fuels. But what I what I realized then and have realized more so ever since is that we can make a much better economy by not burning the carbon in such resources. So ultimately, anything that rots or burns, anything that's renewable and subject to rotting, or anything that burns, including fossil fuels, can be much more valuable if you turn them into carbon and hydrogen. And so I've developed a number of practical ways and equipment for turning substances that rot or burn into carbon and hydrogen. The carbon can be used, for instance, to reinforce equipment that can be stronger than steel and lighter than aluminum. And in whatever application may require it, more conductive than copper. So the allotropes, the various forms of carbon that can be utilized are virtually encyclopedic in variations and, and capabilities. But consider, for instance, a roofing material that's carbon enhanced that can collect more energy in one day in many areas of application compared to the energy you get from burning that carbon one time. So, right. Well, here in Hawaii, can, we're, we're kind of lucky, too, because um, we actually deal a lot with um, fiberglass and polyester resins and epoxy resins in surfboards. You know, that's one of our big pastimes here. 
And so the, the concept of carbon reinforced or carbon fiber reinforced um, products is actually not very foreign to the folks here in Hawaii, particularly the surfers. Um, they understand the strength to weight and, um, and all that good stuff. But there's some other great properties in carbon fiber besides the, the lightness and the strength. What are some of the other uh, advantages to carbon fiber and carbon well, products? Well, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazingly more corrosion resistant than aluminum or titanium or steel or stainless steel. So Boeing has already proven that through the use of carbon reinforcement in the 777 and the 787 that you have a much greater durability against fatigue and corrosion for longevity and much more return on investment. And that's coupled with the fuel savings. So it's an exponential value in time as you save a lot of fuel, but you also save a lot of maintenance as, as it goes on in service. And, and for like, a, you know, vehicles nowadays, for those that work on vehicles and understand the direct current electric system, 12 volt system in cars, uh, virtually the whole chassis and body is the, the uh, negative terminal. And all you have to do is touch the negative terminal to uh, the negative side of a, an appliance and then hot wire to the battery and you've got a current flow. And so, so you have that advantage with carbon as well, don't you? You do. And you have a um, further advantage in optics. You can make it a transparent, like a diamond is transparent, coating, diamond-like coatings that greatly improve the, the longevity and durability of, of optics of all kinds. And then also can be a network of other colors, but mostly by, uh, with enough depth can be black for collecting a wide spectrum of radiation or blocking it if you want to have protection against electromagnetic pulse damages. Ah, I see. So it's vast variety of uh, better than burning applications. Well, what are some of your current projects that you're working on that you'd, uh, you'd like to tell us about that um, you know can help us move towards that carbon uh, and uh, renewable, sustainable economy? Well, given that you can make a bet much better economy by not burning carbon and, and instead turning it into durable goods, and, and what I'm working on more currently then is how to make hydrogen much more convenient. And a product called METROL, M-E-T-R-O-L, is a net hydrogen liquid fuel that you can store at ambient temperature and pressure in existing gasoline or diesel or jet fuel tanks. And so in use, however, it's the same as if you just use hydrogen, even though you can carry it as a dense liquid with an energy density that's on par with gasoline or diesel. So you have the ability to distribute this hydrogen as metro, use it for the purpose of operating a fuel cell or a heat engine, or for that matter, to cook your supper, and have the impact on the environment as if you only use hydrogen. Uh, I know that a lot of folks have tried to use hydrogen in internal combustion engines and just basically replace the, the, um, the fuel uh, in, the, in the system uh, without doing any compression or anything. And it just didn't seem to work out very well. You know, what's, what's the key to really getting the performance out of an internal combustion engine using just hydrogen. Because as Paul Pontio points out, and I know you probably uh, told this to many people, we've got a, probably a couple billion internal combustion engines running on this planet. And by the time we get fuel cell uh, electric vehicles out there, it's, it's gonna be a couple decades uh, before we have them out there in mass, just by the, the sheer volume that the industry has to, to start producing. Um, but you have some technology that you're looking at converting internal combustion engines to run off hydrogen and use this metrol fuel and um, clean the air uh, and then you don't lose any power. Can you, can you explain that process? Well, Paul's right. It's uh, really important to deal with the 1.2 billion and growing population of heat engines that run the industrial revolution for us. And the way that I've learned to do it is actually make more power and much more range for energy efficiency out of the same engine by not throttling the air. So the 
engine's allowed to take in as much air as it can possibly get during intake. And then after the combustion chamber is closed, I directly inject the hydrogen and ignite it. And for the large part, it can be done after top dead center. So whatever pressure is in the injection is added to the torque production from the engine. So you get better than diesel torque and better than diesel fuel efficiency out of a net hydrogen impact on the environment when you use a device that I call the smart plug to provide that injection. And the way it enables the engine to last longer is because it burns that hydrogen within surplus air. Because you emitted more air, you have more air, and thus you can burn more fuel or burn whatever fuel is emitted as a stratified charge, so it's insulated by air. There's air on the piston, and air on the cylinders, and air on the rings, and air on the valves, and so forth, so that the hydrogen combustion produces steam, and then the exhaust is condensable water. So you absolutely take away what is now wearing the engine by particles that are produced from fossil fuels or hydrocarbon fuels, and you take away the acids that they produce so you don't have corrosion on the bearings and other critical surfaces from the acid that develops. Okay. But you so, do have... So the, uh, the, the stratified charge part is, I think, something that is critical for people to understand that, you know, in a regular uh, internal combustion engine, you basically have a carburetor that mixes the fuel in the air, injects it in well below top dead center, sucks it into the combustion chamber, compresses that homogenized mix, that, that mix of air and fuel, and then compresses it and then ignites it. But your system, you're saying, you're basically just compressing all the air, as much air as you can get into the cylinder, compressing it, and at, at near top dead center, you're injecting hydrogen into the middle of that air mass. So what's the advantage to doing that? Well, the advantage is, as you suggest, you burn on a surplus air basis, and that air insulates the combustion of the hydrogen. So the engine the doesn't get as hot? Yeah, so you're clean. Okay. The engine doesn't have blow-by of the fuel-air mixture of the homogeneous charge. Neither does it have the loss of heat that's immediate and large to the piston and to the cylinder, and incidentally, by the aerosol production of the lubricating film, so you don't lose your lubricant, you don't lose the heat, and you are able to complete the combustion much more rapidly than the typical hydrocarbon fuel. Hydrogen burns round numbers five to 15 times faster. The higher the compression, the faster it burns. So you can do most of the injection after top dead center and add whatever pressure that you've delivered to the torque development of the engine. Great. So it, and, and what does that do to the, to the NOx uh, release from the engine? Well, you can absolutely prevent oxides of nitrogen by this smart plug that watches the combustion and prevents the fuel rate from causing the peak combustion temperature to exceed about 2200 degrees C, above which you get oxides of nitrogen and below which you do not. And that's a big important factor when you when you do talk about air pollution and um, and contaminants in the air. The things that uh, everybody's concerned about is, is carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and NOx. And um, well, and a lot of times the NOx is the real boogaboo to try and get rid of. That's quite right. But once you handle that question and do so for every mode of operation, whether it's idle or acceleration or cruise or full power, you're engine becomes an air cleaner for whatever you shouldn't have in your lungs. It'll it'll eliminate pollen, tire particles, and diesel soot, and peroxyacetyl nitrate in the smog of a community as you operate. So you can do the public service, drive and clean the air as you use hydrogen in retrofitted engines. That's quite a concept that you'd actually use your internal combustion engine to clean the air. I think that's what we really need to be focusing on nowadays to catch up because we've, uh, we've pushed the limits on internal combustion engines. Hey, you know what? Well, um, it, it, it's about time for us to take a quick break here, Roy, and I'm going to break away for a second so we can talk about some of the other shows. 
And we'll be right back with you to, to talk a little bit more about Metrol and, uh, and maybe get into your book. Hi, and thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Justine Espiritu, and I host the Hawaii Food and Farmer series with my co-host Matthew Johnson of Oahu Fresh. Every week we bring on farmers as well as all the other individuals and organizations that help support a thriving sustainable food system. In fact, it's interesting to learn what others are doing so you don't have to be a Hawaii resident or producing food on Hawaii to be featured on the show, like today's guest, Wyatt Bryson of Jewels of the Forest and Microlab Solutions. Aloha. Thank you. It's been a pleasure being on the show. Um, I love uh, seeing what you guys do and I really support your mission. And uh, it's really nice being back in Hawaii. And uh, thank you again. It's an honor. So you can see guests like Wyatt every Thursday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan the Energy Man here talking to Roy McAllister from Phoenix, Arizona. And Roy has been doing hydrogen since Probably I was still trying to learn how to spell my own name. Now, this guy is, is like the guru of, of gurus in hydrogen. And we've been, we've been talking quite a bit in the first half of the show about uh, a process that he's developed called uh, Metrol and uh, a way of uh, changing the timing and the injection of fuel into a regular internal combustion engine that can not only help give us um, a, a great performing engine, but actually clean the air of pollutants that are... That are uh, that are in the air right now. Um, but the whole genesis he started with was the fact that he realized that, um, you know, his work uh, around the railroads and things like that, he was just basically teaching engineers to burn more carbon fuel and he wanted to make a difference in the world. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have a couple patents here and there, you know, one or two, maybe five or six. Um, Mr. McAllister has over 200 patents in hydrogen and um, I think he has a challenge for everybody, and I'd, I'd like to, to start off right. Why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, what you'd like uh, people to do? You know, you, this is your your chance to sit there and challenge everybody with what to do uh, and, and move us all towards that that um, uh, carbon emission free future and a sustainable future. Well, the reason for the patents is to enable communities to have new ventures, and I envision ten thousand new communities around the world. And so these new ventures can license that technology and I'll provide the technology transfers so that they can make a much more profitable outcome for carbon than to burn it. And this is furthermore an opportunity for those communities to produce water. They, they can actually take bad water, such as uh, wastewater, and electrolyze it into hydrogen and oxygen and use the hydrogen in an internal combustion engine or a fuel cell to make new water. So you make clean water out of bad water in the operation. And the metro can be used as an energy storage medium for storing any surplus wind or solar or moving water energy as the community saves for a rainy day, so to speak, or for a diurnal cycle during the day when they need energy and the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. So, so you, they can make them. You've been out here to Hawaii. And did You got to see Blue Planet Research on the Big Island, didn't you? Oh, I was really pleased with the progress. I'll tell you what, Hawaii has really good talent, capabilities, and examples of what to do. Blue Planet Research is really doing it. Paul Poncio and Hank Rogers are really doing the right thing. And helping the public see hands-on in, in the sense of experiencing the use of hydrogen, hands-on hydrogen at Blue Planet. Yeah, I agree. He's, uh, he's been my uh, spark plug and uh, my super injector there for getting me going in hydrogen and firing me up when I'm, when, especially when I'm having a particularly challenging day. I just call Paul and he gets me all excited again about uh, the kind of work we're doing. Um, That's good. It's, it's just a, a joy to go over and spend some time on that ranch and work with them on the hydrogen projects. Um, so what are some of the, uh, well, let me, first of all, talk about the Solar Hydrogen uh, Civilization book that you have out there. It's been out, and actually, I don't know where my copy is because I think I loaned it to somebody. I never got it back, so I may have to go on Amazon and buy a bunch of them uh, 
to give out to folks and, and get them uh, up, spinning up to speed on, on your work there. But um, that's kind of the genesis of your book, right? The uh, getting the, the economy going and getting communities on board and making this an economic advantage to them, not just a environmental advantage to them, correct? Well, it's very true. In fact, you know, the idea of the book is to say that if you like civilization, if you think civilization is worthwhile, and I think it's the greatest invention of mankind on earth. Humans haven't had a better idea than to have civilization. But if you want it to be successful, more successful, we need to have sustainable economic development in virtually every community. So what the book is about is, is how to do that, how to take substances that are widely available, that rot or burn, and turn them into carbon as a durable good and use the hydrogen as the energy currency for fuel cell and when we have enough to carry the load and for engines in the meantime that make them able to carry more load and do so with much more endurance and return on investment. Okay. You also have another uh, DVD out there and one of the books that um, that you kind of uh, worked on when you, with that one DVD was uh, Making Hydrogen. And what, what should intrigue uh, a lot of folks, especially um, you folks that are a lot more technical, uh, chemical engineers, chemistry majors, physics majors, um, into higher engineering stuff. Roy does a great job of talking about the technology of making hydrogen. And the surprising thing is the book he's using, I think was published first in 1919. Um, and the technology, this hydrogen technology that, that we're working with is not new technology. It's been around for at least 150 years, and the safety f aspects, the, um, the benefits, the electrical benefits, I mean, everything you can imagine about hydrogen has been studied so deeply, and, uh, and Roy's kind of like the, the font of, uh, of all that knowledge compressed into one human being. Um, that's why it's so great to sit down and listen to him talk about it, because he can approach the subject from strictly a, an engineering, chemical engineering and, uh, and physics perspective or an economic perspective or a personal uh, commitment and environmentally uh, sustainable perspective. And so I'd, I'd encourage everybody out there, we've, we've thrown up a couple of uh, images of the, uh, that, that book that I talked about, which is um, Chemistry and Manufacture of Hydrogen. Uh, the book is actually by um, Lithlin Teed in 1919. And uh, you can get the DVD version where Roy actually has a discussion and explains the chemistry and explains the, the processes. But um, it must have been fun actually looking through that book, uh, Roy, and, and, and interpreting for us as regular folks uh, all the things in that book. But it's pretty amazing. What, what did you like most about that book by T? Well, first of all, I really like to give credit to the pioneers of hydrogen. In, in my book, The Solar Hydrogen Civilization, I devote quite a bit of print to the, to the pioneers. And it, you, know, you come to find Teed's work as really a worthwhile reference that by 1990, the chemistry was well worked out for how to make hydrogen by a number of different techniques. And how to do so, in, including, by the way, the, the Civil War era technique that was used to have 3,000 successful hydrogen balloon observation flights that the North used to fly higher than the ability of the rifles at the time to reach them, but to do observations and to provide a, a good map of who was moving where and where they were strong and not in the Civil War. Well, let's, let's talk just that, a little bit about that for a second. You know, you, the Civil War was like the mid-1800s, 1860, 1865 time frame, and yet the right. Hindenburg was in the early 1900s, so 60 years yes. later. So there was 60 years worth of using hydrogen in inflatable, uh, lighter-than-air airships, and, and did they have any major safety issues with hydrogen all that time? You know, it's amazing that until 1937, when the Hindenburg caught fire in Lakehurst, New Jersey, the dirigibles, the hydrogen dirigibles, had an amazingly good safety record. The 
hydrogen dirigibles had flown transatlantic flights had flown around the poles, around the North Pole at least, on observation flights, and had proven that the fastest way across the ocean and the safest way across the ocean was in the hydrogen dirigible. That's really amazing. quite remarkable. What's even more fascinating in that regard was that the designers, even even in Thaddeus Lowe's time in the Civil War, had thoroughly realized that this was a very inexpensive way to have a lighter than air capability of having endurance in the air with whatever else you did for propulsion. Just having a lighter than air capability was an enormous advantage compared to having a heavier and air aircraft used a lot of fuel to keep up to, to stay at altitude. But the lighter than air concept was well proven to be safe and fast for transatlantic and transpolar flights. Well, that's, you know, hydrogen has such an amazing history, and you did a, a great job of explaining that in, uh, in that DVD talking about um, Teed's work. Um, even talked about uh, World War II when the Japanese used the hydrogen uh, lifting body to, to transport a bomb that made it all the way to the continental United States. Um, that, yep. That's pretty impressive as well. I mean, things that most yep. people don't know. And, and I really encourage folks to, to, to take a, a few minutes and, and look up uh, Roy McAllister's work and, uh, and get, definitely get his book, Hydrogen Civilization, and also uh, maybe check out uh, the DVD he did on on Mr. Teed's book, or Major Teed's book, on uh, production of hydrogen. They're both outstanding. So, you know, Roy, we've got about 30 seconds left, and I'd like to leave it to you for any closing comments. Well, we can have a sustainable economic development in every community with the technologies that you're free to read on, on those published patents you can find on Google slash patents under my name, Roy McAllister. So you got a lot of homework out there, everyone. Definitely look at Roy's patents. You can check out his uh, his uh, works on that on the book he wrote, and also the DVD he did on Teed's book. And I'm telling you, by the time you finish that, you'll have more knowledge in your head about hydrogen than you could possibly imagine. So, Roy, thanks for being with us on the show today, and I guarantee you, we're going to have to have you back because there's so much more to talk about, and you have so much more uh, more that you can impart on us uh, on hydrogen and what it can do for our, our society. Uh, it's a joy working with you. It's an honor to know you. And uh, I look forward to having you back here on another show later on. So thank you so much. And um, we'll catch you next time I'm over there. And you got to come to Hawaii sometime, okay? Looking forward to it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Roy. And until next week, Stan Energy Man signing off. Aloha. <laughs>